I don't want to hear predictions about South Carolina. <laughs> the Viceroy of New Haven is spoken. Do not utter the words. If you mention Nevada. South Carolina, you will be banished. El virrey de la madre patria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From New York Times Opinion, I'm Ross Douthat. I'm Michelle Cottle. I'm Carlos Lozada. And I'm Lydia Paul Green. And this is Matter of Opinion. So, the Iowa caucuses are over. The 2024, yay, yay huzzah! <laughs> the 2024 <laughs> presidential primary campaign has begun. Oh, or boy. it might, or, or in fact, it know. might already be over. Oh, Who can on. say? And, and the answer is, we can say. That's what we're going to talk about today. Specifically, we're going to talk about why Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis weren't able to form a winning or even competitive coalition in Iowa, and also what might possibly keep Donald Trump from being nominated by the Republican Party. So on a scale of one to 10, how exciting, shocking, amazing was this official start to the presidential cycle? Oh. I mean, I would say zero. I, I just I, zero. I'm finding coming it, in strong. I'm fi- finding it hard to have any excitement at all about this uh, this next stage of our national nightmare. Well, exciting is a weird <laughs> word, right? Ex- exciting has like very positive. He that for us, Professor. Exciting Lozano. has positive connotations, right? Like I get excited about going to the theater, about watching my kids, you know, compete in baseball or Irish dance, right? Like, I'm not excited <laughs> about this election cycle. Like, it's very consequential, enormously consequential, right? I think, and we've discussed this before, like, I, th- I think a Biden-Trump rematch, if it comes to that, would be very consequential for the country. But it's exciting in the same sense that, like, waiting to get some serious medical test results back is is oh, exciting. <laughs> yeah, Michelle. Oh, I get really excited about all elections, because there's something deeply wrong with me. That said, no, you're an American. This is democracy. Don't you get a little bit of a pageant thrill? of freedom? People, yeah. automatically people putting their little just... slips of paper in the, in the county. It was yes. it was beautiful. I, I, I enjoyed Thank watching. You. Uh, Thank you, Carlos. That said, you. that's what I was. Looking I am for. on record as not a fan of the Iowa caucuses, in part because I think the process is deeply flawed, and Iowa is a state that's not terribly representative of the U.S. in general, but also because they just have a crap track record of picking even the nominees. So I have issues with Iowa, and this particular Iowa caucus didn't even deliver on things like focusing on retail politics or making it worth your while to, as Ron DeSantis reminded us every 15 minutes, hit all 99 counties, which is the only justification that you ever get for Iowa, which is like, oh, well, you have to go talk to the people. Trump didn't bother. Still fared well. In fact, we didn't have to have them at all because this is basically what we expected going in. No, 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 no. You you always have to play the game. Right. The the faint hint of non-excitement that I guess I'm detecting from all of you, right, obviously (laughs) reflects the fact that Donald Trump won in a walk. um, Biggest Iowa margin ever, probably, right, by beating out Bob Dole. Bob Dole, the former king of Iowa, dethroned by Donald Trump. Now, I think had this been, you know, Trump 38, DeSantis 35, Haley 31 or something, even— That's that's more than 100, Ross. Math is hard. Yes, and wouldn't that have been—wouldn't that have been amazing, too, if (laughs) Iowa had had changed math itself? Think about it. Anyway, do it again with numbers that make sense. (laughs) I think a a closer race might have made even Carlos excited. And so I guess I'm interested in looking backward here a little bit. Was this just guaranteed and all the idea of a competitive race for the Republican nomination always a fantasy or how did how did it come? Well, no, if Ron DeSantis had been a different person. And by that, I mean, yes, he went into it with kind of that populist MAGA bent, and he was a strong governor of a swing state and had the kind of manly tendencies that play well with certain parts of the base. But he's fundamentally unlikable guy. So you can't change that. And presidential politics runs on charisma and personality as much, if not more, than on policy. So if 
he had been a different guy. But, you know, that's like saying if a frog had wings, it wouldn't bump his ass a hopping. I just like, come on. <laughs> as one says, I frequently... As one always says. He's, as one says, right? But the people who really dig Trump are digging the whole package. They like the kind of crazy, weird rambling rhetoric. They like his authoritarianism. They like his insults. They like a lot of that. And you can't just hand all of the rest of it off, but not hand off any of the charisma or persona and expect it to stick. Ron DeSantis can't be a demagogue without any kind of kind of compelling personality. That's, that just wasn't going to go anywhere for a party that has been trained to love a celebrity TV host. So, you know, I was thinking about this, and I think that, that sometimes because Donald Trump is so unusual and strange, it can sometimes feel like everything about him is just sort of outside of historical memory. And, you know, there, the thing that, that I was just sort of struck by thinking back of the kind of successful creators of new coalitions. And, you know, Trump, I think, has been a very successful creator of a new coalition for the Republican Party, is that it it, it doesn't seem that there's like a strong track record of being able to hand that coalition on, right? Like, um, you know, you could say, I guess, Ronald Reagan was able to hand his coalition on to his successor, George H.W. Bush, but then, for you know, one for, for one election. Right. right. Um, and then you get to Clinton. He was not able to hand over to Al Gore, although that was a very close election, as, as we all recall. And then Obama, of course, was unable to hand on to um, to, uh, to Hillary, Clinton. Uh, Hillary Clinton. Gosh, how did I forget that? Name? <laughs> how Freudian quickly we slip. forget. Oh, so, and, and, you know, like it struck me as I was as I was looking back at this history that like it's actually like a, a particular particular politician assembling a particular coalition, it's very hard to hand that coalition off to anybody else, right? And it's particularly hard if that politician has, like, not left the national stage, right? <laughs> exactly. Like, Obama yeah. was... He Obama doesn't was, want so to like, hand it off to anyone. But even if he did, it would still be hard to hand off, you know? So, so it, I don't know. I, I'm curious what you guys think, because, like, I think there's this assumption that, like, Donald Trump is so special, and that's part of why. But, like, I, it actually might not be the case that this may just be, like, a problem of politics. I, I think one reason that people have... People on the right, especially people who are into DeSantis, have imagined some kind of... Trumpism without Trump is that there is this kind of populist nationalist thing going on all over the Western world. Yeah. So it, it seems, it, from that perspective, it seems like some of what Trump did should be reproducible because you can see versions of it in, you know, France, Italy, wherever you want to look. But yes, trying to do it <laughs> while the prior, while the prior embodiment of that coalition is still very much on the stage and doesn't want to pass the baton is a bit of a challenge. And that that also shows the sort of the dilemma that people like DeSantis and Haley faced in this campaign. Like, one thing they could have done, I mean, this is kind of crazy, very unorthodox, but like, they could have actually run against Trump. Like, they had this dilemma, right? They know that a huge chunk of the party loves Trump, but they also are trying to beat Trump. So what do they do? They can go hard against Trump, like Chris Christie, right? They can suck up to Trump, like Vivek Ramaswamy. You know, what do those two guys both have in common? They're both already out. So what did DeSantis and Haley do? They just kind of danced around him. They stayed in this murky middle, you know, and that might help them do better than Christie and Ramaswamy, but it almost guarantees they're not going to win. DeSantis, as you said, Ross, he's like, I'm Trumpism without Trump, right? I'm Trump without the baggage. Haley is like, he was the right guy at the right time, but maybe someone younger is better, you know, and chaos just kind of follows him like a like a fairy godmother. You know, I don't I mean, it's just like, you know, <laughs> it, it being his whole plan. Right. You know, right. And, and so they don't offer an alternative to Trump, except in this very vague way. Like I have a different I'm Trump, but with a different attitude or I'm Trump, but younger. And Republican voters love Trump's attitude and don't care about his age. So it doesn't seem like right, except maybe at the very, very end, like the night before Iowa. You know, did they actually try to run against him? But I think that the other thing is that, you know, if you sort of zoom out, like, you have to have a story for, like, why you want to be president, you know, and why people should pick you. You have to have an idea. And, like, th- I guess that's why I sort of started with this coalition question, because a coalition, like, builds around somebody who can be a kind of Pied Piper, right, who plays a new tune that people hear and decide that they want to follow. Um, and trying to be, like— 
X but with Y, you know, um, that's not playing a new tune. And is there an example of someone who's successfully become president by saying, I'm going to be like X but, like, you know, less charismatic or more competent? That's not how presidential politics in the United States works. That's not how how coalitions get built. Um, I don't see how any of the candidates that were vying to defeat Donald Trump had any sort of message or idea of what coalition they could build that would be separate and different from the one that that Trump clearly already owned. I mean, so to play devil's advocate for a minute, right, I I don't disagree with any of the critiques of where DeSantis ended up, but DeSantis had a story, or he thought he did, right, when he started running. He was, his story was, one, he was a big winner uh, in a party that has lost a lot of winnable elections in the Trump era. DeSantis didn't just win. He won big. He expanded the Republican coalition in Florida. I mean, he's passing lots of things that conservatives like through the Florida legislature with this kind of brand as a competent governor who handled COVID better than the blue states did. I know this is highly contested, but this was obviously part of his narrative, right? And who was picking, who was really good at picking a fight with the excesses of the left. And that, you know, as narratives go, that obviously has a, it doesn't have sort of a single thing. It has a lot of different pieces. But I I think DeSantis thought that he was going to be a little bit like George W. Bush when he ran for president, which is to say, look, the Republican Party in D.C. is dysfunctional. Trump ended up being part of the dysfunction. I'm a, a popular governor from a big state who knows how to get things done and has a sort of, you know, a different brand than other people in the rest of the party. I think that's what he was thinking. I didn't, we've been talking about Ron DeSantis, but of course what happened in Iowa is that DeSantis got, you know, about half of the not Trump vote and the other half went to Nikki Haley. So DeSantis got the conservatives who didn't want to vote for Trump and Haley got the moderates and some independents who didn't want to vote for Trump. So now Haley gets her chance. And going into New Hampshire, it's a state where famously John McCain was able to upset George W. Bush, notwithstanding Bush's charm, with a coalition that included a lot of moderates and independents. So so now we need, you know, you failed me with excitement about Iowa. Can you give me some excitement about New Hampshire? <laughs> Can Nikki Haley win New Hampshire? Probably not. But okay. Wait, possibly, probably not means means possibly yes. Possibly yes. Yeah, yeah, possibly okay. yes. Yeah. It's certainly possible and it would certainly be interesting. <laughs> it's a you know, I do think that that Iowa and New Hampshire do offer us a really interesting kind of core sample of different parts of the Republican base. So I think it'll be a fascinating um, result in seeing, you know, sort of what's at the water's edge uh, for Trump. Well, in the latest polls, DeSantis is like, is like what, at five or six percent? I mean, that's I, not I he's why. not really <laughs> attempting to compete oh, there. I mean, on. one thing about Iowa, like it's great to win Iowa, I'm sure. Right. It's also useful to remember that, you know, nominee Ted Cruz, Rick Santorum and Mike Huckabee. They all won Iowa. They all got swamped in New Hampshire. But I mean, you know, if you look at polls, Nikki Haley has a much better shot in New Hampshire than she did in Iowa. So, you know, it's definitely not a foregone conclusion that she's going to to lose New Hampshire. You want to tear down New Hampshire, Ross, or shall I? Well, uh, Suffolk University, Boston Globe poll of likely New Hampshire voters has Trump 50, Haley 34. So right, that's that's to, that's much much closer than she was in Iowa. <laughs> you know, this is true. Yeah, but there yes. had been there had been polls showing them much much more. Yeah, like like seven you know, seven, seven, seven points. Yeah. yeah, those were likely Republican voters, or those were likely voters who will turn out in the Republican primary. Are they registered Republicans? Because that's the thing about New Hampshire. No, this one includes independents, and Haley is winning winning independents. Okay, that is actually a big red flag for her because what makes New Hampshire difficult. When you're looking at the broader picture, you have all these undeclared independent moderates who can just show up the day of and, you know, vote however the spirit moves them in whichever primary they have felt like that does not necessarily reflect the Republican base anywhere else much. So even if Nikki wins it there, that doesn't that doesn't tell us that much. All right. Well, on that note, why don't we talk about whether there's anything that Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis or the Supreme Court or God himself could do to prevent Donald Trump from being the Republican nominee. But we'll do that right after the break. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
And we're back. So, guys, before the break, I had mentioned the latest poll from New Hampshire showing Donald Trump easily defeating Nikki Haley. But notably, even in that really good for Trump poll, he still has 50 percent of the vote, which is about what he had when all the counting was done in Iowa, which would mean that in both of the first two Republican states to vote, at least around half of the primary electorate seems open to voting for somebody else. If you guys were in charge of Nikki Haley's campaign right now, your task in the next month is to get that 50 percent of the party that's open to someone else to vote for you. How would you do it? What would you do? Is it just impossible? It can't be done? You can't unite the DeSantis and Haley factions? One, one question that I'd have is that 50 percent is not never Trump, right? That 50 percent is, eh, you know, if there's an alternative, I'd consider it. And so I think that, let's say, miraculously, Ron DeSantis decides to drop out uh, today and he's not in the race. Where do we think DeSantis's voters are likely to go? I have a feeling that more of them will go to Trump than they would go to, to Nikki Haley. So I think in some ways, even though she is the sort of embodiment of the quote unquote moderate, although I certainly don't consider her record to be moderate. We're grading on a curve. Uh, yeah, sort of like acceptable post-Trump nominee to the so-called establishment. I don't see how she gets very much of the available vote that would be open to Donald Trump to come to her. I mean, to me, that's the sort of the big question is how does she get that? Those people who are kind of OK with Trump and on the more conservative side of things. I'm interested in that 50 percent, too, Lydia, and how you unpack it. First of all, to look at Trump's victory in Iowa as anything but like what it is, which is the biggest Republican blowout in the history of the Iowa caucuses and try to find like a, well, maybe actually it shows that a lot of people don't like him. It seems I'm not so persuaded by that, especially what 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 did Vivek Ramaswamy get close to 8 percent? His whole campaign was about being pro-Trump. So you have to assume that a lot of his voters go to Trump. As you mentioned, a lot of DeSantis's voters would go to Trump if DeSantis drops out soon, as may very well happen. Then suddenly it's well above 50. You know, it's not quite Saddam Hussein, you know, uh, vote getting, um, but <laughs> it's, 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 it's right, very right. It's, large. It's 65-35. I think if you just did head-to-head Haley Trump the rest of the way, yeah. that's what you'd get. Yeah, and so— DeSantis and Haley will probably, when they drop out, will endorse Trump anyway. Yeah, no, they, they certainly will. The only person who probably won't endorse Trump is maybe like Chris Christie. Chris Christie will not endorse Trump. The only flaw with your analysis, Carlos, is that Trump is an incumbent. Yes, he's, he's running not. in the primary. He has challengers. He's not. But he is running effectively as an no, 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 no. He's not. It seems like trying too hard to say, like, in effect, he's like an incumbent. And by incumbent measures, you know, he's not doing as well as we would have thought. I, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to diminish or I'm not you know, I'm not arguing either way. I'm I'm actually just interested. It is striking that for such a formidable political force, Trump is, I think, a really unique figure in our politics who has this aura of invincibility and inevitability. Basically, half of his party is like open to somebody else. But I think that that's a soft open. I don't think it's like, oh, yeah, we're never going to vote for Trump. And I think that ultimately those people will align around Trump because ultimately I think the party believes he's a winner. I see the 50 percent and think it is gargantuan. Hmm. I don't think it is a sign of weakness. Well, Ross, what do you think? I mean, Joe Biden is an actual incumbent. Yes. And at the moment, we're all assuming that he's going to win over Dean Phillips and Marianne Williamson by something like 95 to 5. Mm -hmm. So Trump is not inevitable in that way. I think that's all that we're suggesting by sort of floating this figure. And I mean, I think in 2016, when Trump was not a 50 percent guy, he was a 35 to 40 percent guy. There was a world where some kind of weird alliance between probably Cruz and Rubio, which was talked about by their campaigns, I believe, might have successfully derailed him. I think Haley and DeSantis are just too weak in different ways. Trump's coalition is too large for that to work. But also it's just ambition. I I think Haley probably, we t- you know, we talked about her as a vice presidential nominee. I think her taking sort of extreme steps to form an anti-Trump coalition would 
endanger whatever chances she has of being Trump's running mate, and she's not going to do that. And I'm sure DeSantis is thinking to himself, I will come back and run in 2028, <laughs> when, of course, Trump will actually run again himself yeah. <laughs> after losing this time. Not, not, as, not as an incumbent. Trump will lose to Biden, and he will be back in 2028. Okay, so nobody seems to think that Nikki Haley, even if she wins New Hampshire, can stop Trump. So is there anything that can stop Trump? Is there a possibility that the Supreme Court will prevent Trump from being the Republican no. nominee? No. I think it's actually not unthinkable that there will be some kind of adverse ruling. Could there be a majority on the Supreme Court that, like, doesn't want Donald Trump to be able to run for president and can find a reason to keep him from running for president? Are there, you know, legitimate arguments that could be marshaled about the fundamentally counter-majoritarian protections that are in the Constitution? Absolutely. How would the country respond to that? I think there would definitely be a very, very strong response from Trump's base. Well, I mean, I, I think you could look at the landscape and say, actually, maybe not very much would follow from this. Yes, Trump was able to stir up a protest that turned into a mob once on January 6th. But since then, it's not like we have, you know, million man marches in the cities of this country by people who think Joe Biden is not the legitimate president. Trump's record of actually stirring up people and getting them to actually take to the streets as opposed to just voting for him is not incredibly strong. Trumpism is not a mass protest He's movement. He's only managed to foment one insurrection. That's just like just one bad. insurrection. And, and Ross doesn't even really believe it counts as an insurrection. Well, that's why I think it's different with the impeachment versus the Supreme Court. He has been tried in Congress and acquitted of being accused of fomenting an insurrection, which is a different prospect than the Supreme Court ruling that he participated in an insurrection. Ross, do you know how it ended do you know how it how um how January 6th um ended, how the violence stopped? Trump told them to go home. Right? So to, to, to say that it only happened once to me feels um a little a little disingenuous about the the ability for something to happen again. Trump told them to leave. Because he's a great patriot and didn't want any violence, Carlos. <laughs> I'm not optimistic about what'll happen in the case of an adverse ruling against him in the Supreme Court. Just to sort of step back a bit, I mean, like, I think what lies at the core of this for me is this question, is Trump unique? Would essentially taking him out of the process, like, cool the fever and lead us back to a more kind of normal political landscape? I mean, you could imagine a future in which, you know, Donald Trump is disqualified from running, maybe Nikki Haley wins, maybe Joe Biden manages to squeak it out and, and wins against Nikki Haley or, or Ron DeSantis, like, if fine. If Trump were disqualified, Nikki Haley would not be the Republican nominee. Someone will pick up the torch, right? J.D. Like, Vance. J.D. Vance will pick it up and run in the next election, perhaps even challenging President Nikki Haley for being insufficiently aligned with the base. But I'm curious if you guys think, I mean, is Trump uniquely dangerous? You know, the, the fact that no one has been able to essentially pick up his mantle and run with it, despite all of his difficulties, makes me wonder, um, you know, the idea, does, you know, Trumpism without Trump have a future? No, but I think it's a good question. Like, there are pieces of Trumpism that existed well before Trump, as Ross is quick to remind us. Like, he has unleashed a certain kind of populism and brought it to the forefront. This sort of thing has been picked up by other people, including J.D. Vance, who are very different dispositionally or politically than Trump. Now, I, I've seen Vance on the stump. He ain't all that. But there are plenty of people out there. And while Trump is dangerous in his particular way, there could be somebody else out there who's dangerous in a different kind of way. The way I see this particular era Ending is the wrong word, but let's say transitioning, is that liberals and Democrats and especially sort of centrist Mandarin elites need to reconcile themselves to the idea that certain aspects of populism are just going to be part of democratic politics from now on. You're never not going to have a Republican nominee who is willing to build a wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. Like, that's just going to be a feature of politics. You're never not probably going to have a Republican nominee who doesn't want to root out DEI programs in elite universities. That's not going away. I, You know, I could go down a list of things that liberals consider deplorable that are not going away. 
what you want to go away is the special edition that Trump gives you that culminated in January 6th of refusing to accept election results and being totally shameless in your sort of flagrant misbehavior. Like, yeah, you'll get some other form of populism and liberals will hate it, but it will just want to build the wall. It won't also have, you know, Sidney Powell in there talking about hacked voting machines. <laughs> no, what you'll have is you'll have something that we're experiencing right now, which is the exciting thrill of Ron DeSantis on the campaign trail. You will have a normal politician who's going out and trying to persuade people with his or her limited charisma, like lack of whatever that magic celebrity thing that Trump has, trying to actually sell these policies. So I agree with you. I think those are all going to be features of our politics for a very long time. But like they they're not working for Ron DeSantis. He visited all 99 counties and barely scraped 20 percent in the Iowa um, caucuses. And if you look at the record of politicians who are not Trump trying to play the Trump game and trying to get into office at the state level, like it's not a happy record. I mean, particularly not in swing states. So I actually am not persuaded. I think that the ideas are going to be there and these policies are going to be there. But I actually don't think the ideas and the policies are what matter. I think it's the swagger. I think it's the attitude. And I think that there's a lot of low propensity voters who turn out for Trump because they just like the guy who are not going to turn out, you know, when the candidate is, you know, J.D. Vance or Ron DeSantis or whoever else. Yeah, it's going to take another special man meeting his moment mm. or woman if, you know, you can get that through the Republican Party. But I don't know. I don't know. It's not going to just be anybody with those policies. Well, ma some of, many of those policies are just popular, which is why DeSantis, despite his charisma deficit, was able to be elected governor of Florida. Of Florida, in a landslide, but not of right? the United States, right? I mean, Ross, I agree with you 100 percent that those those are just going to be features of American politics for a long time to come. I'm not as persuaded by the notion that that somehow it can stop there, that it can just stop at the policies, which is, in the end, a normal democratic debate over substantive questions without saying, you know, without holding on to the part that you don't like. Because guess who doesn't make that clear distinction? Voters. If you looked at Iowa in some of the um, entrance polls, about 60 percent or more of the voters did not accept that Biden was a legitimate president. We are not at a place where the voters are making that distinction between the policies and not accepting legitimacy of elections being in two different universes. So, you know, it's not just the court, right? It's not just how will people respond depending what the court does. If Trump is a convicted felon before the election, what will that do? Well, the effect of the indictments, Carlos, is a great question, and that at least we'll undoubtedly get to discuss another time. <laughs> so for now, let's leave it there, and we'll be right back with our hot or cold. And we're back. And finally, it's time for our hot cold segment where every week one of us shares something that we're into or over or somewhere in between. So who has it this week? Me. Yes, me. And I just want to say I am red hot on hot doggers, which what? I will now what? unpack for you. Sounds spicy. From now through the <laughs> end of January, the fine folks at Oscar Mayer are accepting applications to join the company's 37th class of Wienermobile drivers. Now, please tell me you people have seen these. You know what the Wienermobile is. Who's seen I know one what on the, the road? Wienermobile Anyone? I, Anyone? I, I Ross, you got to get out of Connecticut have. more. Just say. I think I know what the Wienermobile oh, is. Oh, for God's sake. Hmm. So the Wienermobile has been on the road, some version of it, since 1936. Right. It is a 27-foot-long hot dog car. They are absolutely glorious. I used to see these driving through the South when I would, like, be on the highways. And Now, I love learning about quirky, weirdo jobs and what they entail, you know, and how people wind up in them. Dog food taster, golf ball diver, crime scene cleaner, all these things. 
these are the jobs that make America interesting. But becoming a hot dogger is just the best. And it is apparently quite competitive and very serious business. Fewer than 1% of applicants get selected, which the company is quick to point out, makes it harder than getting into an Ivy League school. It's a year-long gig. You travel the country. You drive like 20,000 miles on average. You get to do things like preside over weddings in Vegas, kick it in Puerto Rico. You hand out Wienermobile whistles, which... <laughs> If anybody's how, looking for an early is birthday gift, is, is this me? ending with your application? And I just want to say this is your application. I just want to say that this is my plan B. How many Wienermobiles are on the road at any given time? There are six. I'm glad you six. asked. There are That's, six Wienermobiles. Why are there only six? I mean, there are 50 states. I, I, yeah. I. I I think I knew what the Wienermobile was, but I definitely have never seen one on the road. And now I feel like I'm missing out. Shouldn't there be one you per are. state? You're actually missing out. To, re- to encounter one of these babies on the interstate is to see the face of God. It is beautiful. <laughs> I am serious. I think a company spokesman put it as your job would be bringing buns of fun to the public. Who doesn't I, I mean, love that? I, I do that every day. Buns of fun? Anyway. Uh, uh. So I'm, I'm actually nominating Carlos for this job. I'm going to put well, in an application the, well, do, on do, your do, behalf. Do you know something probably. about my, my staying power at the New York Times that I just you haven't know told that me about? you could spread hot dog love throughout this country. <laughs> but you don't You don't have to wear... So oh, my wait, oh, my God. Wait, oh, my God. Wait, wait, no. Uh, that's, th- there's, yes, but Ross? There, but you, I just... Last question, really. but Because there's a, there's a hot dog car that features in this very oh much God. memed sketch from the the sketch comedy show, I Think You Should Leave. But in that, the guy is wearing a hot dog suit. Now, you don't yes. have to wear a hot dog suit while you drive the Wienermobile, do you? <laughs> <laughs> they do not mention that. Okay, all right. But, okay. but I want me one of these Wienermobile whistles, people. Thank you, Michelle. We'll see you on the interstate. We'll <laughs> all be in the Wienermobile. Until then, that is our show for the week. Buns of fun. Buns of fun. <laughs> see Thanks, you next guys. week. Bye see you soon. Guys. Next week. Thanks, as always, for joining our conversation. If you liked it, be sure to follow Matter of Opinion on your favorite podcast app. And let us know what big question we should think about next by emailing us at matteropinion at nytimes.com. Matter of Opinion is produced by Derek Arthur, Phoebe Lett, and Sophia Alvarez-Boyd. It's edited by Allison Bruzek and Jordana Hochman. Our fact check team is Kate Sinclair, Mary Marge Locker, and Michelle Harris. Original music by Isaac Jones, Efim Shapiro, Carol Sabaro, Sonia Herrero, and Pat McCusker. Mixing by Carol Sabaro. Audience strategy by Shannon Busta and Christina Samuluski. Our executive producer is Annie Rose Strasser. <laughs> <laughs>